Railroads in the mid-19th century emerge as one of the sort of most active ways in which capitalism is being remade. They become a site of capital investment, both domestically and abroad, the site of state regulation in terms of promoting their development, and they allow commodities to be moved over vast different distances in a way that had never been possible over land before. Ed, what are some of the ways in which, how did these railroads come about in the 1840s and 50s, and how are they differ from earlier kinds of railroads? So railroads actually become one of the drivers of American history in this period, one of the real forces that are, that are pushing political and economic change. But in the 1830s, something was happening that, that uh, maybe we don't uh, expect when we look back at the past. If you looked at who was building railroads in the 1830s, the South, the slave economy, the cotton economy, was building just as many railroads, however you want to measure it, miles of track, whatever, uh, number of locomotives, as the North was. But then when the economy hits the skids in 1837, and that's particularly intense in the South, deep into the 1840s, and of course they repudiate their debts, they can no longer get financing, the economic climate is really bad, and so the South essentially doesn't build railroads in the 1840s. And that's when you see the North and the Midwest really move ahead. That's when there's a real takeoff, yeah, right? And yeah. it's, that, it's a transformation too, because New York City, and American finance, mm -hmm. which had before then really looked to the South and the cotton trade at the center of American finance and trade, begins to look West for the very first time, begins to look West along these new rails, not only as a place to invest, but also ways in which to move those Western commodities to the East. And it starts to look at the shores of Lake Michigan, at this little town on, on the edge of the lake called Chicago. Chicago. Yes, Chicago city of big shoulders, etc. But before it's part of a poem or anything like that, before it's the second city, Chicago is the center of a railroad network that springs up in the 1840s. And this brings all of the products of the upper Midwest and mm -hmm. Illinois and states like that into Chicago and then ships it east to New York. And this is what's so different about Chicago, that it exists at the center of many different kinds of transportation networks. Of course, the, the big lake there, right. but also a radiating fan of small rail lines into the agricultural hinterlands, where all those crops of the West can be shipped to Chicago and then shipped along long trunk lines to the East. And this brings about a lot of different economic transformations, which we'll, we'll talk about over the next couple of sections. But in the process of creating these long trunk line railroads, some other new things happen. So new kinds of... Uh, uh, corporate entities ultimately are, are what develop to govern and, and regulate and organize these railroads. And these are, by their very nature, different from, bigger than, uh, do a different job than any other kind of capitalist enterprise before the 1840s. Railroads are so big that one person can't be in charge. And responsibility has to be distributed over many different functions and an enormous amount of space. And so these new corporations, most importantly the Pennsylvania Railroad, develops new kinds of top-down managerial control. And it's in the railroad that we see the origins of the modern managerial practice, truly, in the corporation. And ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to separate the technical expertise, the engineers and the people who are in charge of laying the track and all that sort of thing from the corporate government itself. So you create these two parallel structures and of course ultimately it's going to be the CEO uh, and, and his henchmen who are going to actually run things. And the engineers and experts and the laborers and so on are all going to be subservient to that centralized structure. That is something that's new in uh, the governance of American economic enterprises. So, Ed, is, is the railroad just the story of the rise of, you know, a more efficient form of organizing capital? Well, I don't know if the corporation is more efficient in all times and places, but it is the rise of a new kind of finance, as increasingly railroads uh, need to have a constant flow of investment. So they turn to what had previously been only one of many American capital markets, and that is Wall Street, a place where common stocks and bonds are traded in lower Manhattan. And Wall Street then assumes a new importance as a place that is not just financing the funding for cotton, but Western development. New York becomes an entrepot 
uh, for European capital to flow into America and finance this Western development. And all of these things have shifted sort of at the same time in the 1840s. Economic development is now leaning more towards the north. Investment is flowing more towards the north. You've had the struggle between Philadelphia, New York City, and New Orleans for control of the sort of high ground of the American financial economy. New York has won. You've had different kinds of possible ways to, inter to organize your economic enterprises. The corporate form has won. So the railroad is driving changes, and we'll continue to see it driving changes as the 19th century rolls on. And of course, as most importantly for the Civil War, the shifting regional attention of northern capital from the south to the west means that there is a possibility of conflict with the south that had not existed before.